Jane Dobry. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry that I do not speak your beautiful language. I'm grateful to the organizers of this conference, especially Professor Novakovsky, for inviting me to talk with you today about this very important topic of classical education in this beautiful building. Poland is leading the world in preserving classical culture at a time when most countries have rejected it. So I and other Americans have much to learn from you about classical culture and classical education. My paper is entitled On Classical and Progressive Education. The cultural transformations that took place in the United States in the 20th century included a debate between defenders of classical education and proponents of progressive education. The purpose of classical education is not to prepare students to enter particular professions or embark on particular careers, but to equip them to begin the lifelong process of attaining human excellence, both intellectual and moral. The tradition of classical education is rooted in the conviction that great minds of the past have discovered important truths about the universe and humanity's role within it that remain true today. Classical education helps students actualize their potential by learning and putting into practice the wisdom of the ages that has stood the test of time. As a living tradition, Classical education is not static, but is constantly expanding our knowledge by applying immutable truths to new problems. Progressive education arose during the 1890s as a many-sided protest against pedagogical narrowness and inequity. The leading intellectual of the progressive education movement was John Dewey, 1859 to 1952, a member of the American philosophical school known as pragmatism, which claims that an ideology or proposition is true if it works satisfactorily, that the meaning of a proposition is to be found in the practical consequences of accepting it, and that unpractical ideas are to be rejected. In line with his philosophical pragmatism, Dewey believed there was an urgent need of a philosophy of education based upon a philosophy of experience. Dewey understood that the primary alternative to his progressive education was the tradition of ancient and medieval Europe. Quote, every moment, movement in the direction of a new order of ideas and of activities directed by them calls for, sooner or later, a return to what appear to be simpler and more fundamental ideas and practices of the past, as is exemplified at present in education in the attempt to revive the principles of ancient Greece and of the Middle Ages." End of quote. Dewey lamented that our present education is dominated almost entirely by the medieval conception of learning and understood the debate between classical and progressive education 
as a contest between belief in immutable truth and trust in the scientific method. Quote, it is argued by the critics of progressive education that science and its method must be subordinated, that we must return to the logic of ultimate first principles expressed in the logic of Aristotle and St. Thomas Aquinas, end of quote. Dewey could see, quote, only two alternatives between which education must choose if it is not to drift aimlessly. One of them is expressed by the attempt to induce educators to return to the intellectual methods and ideals that arose centuries before scientific method was developed. The other alternative is systematic utilization of scientific method as the pattern and ideal of intelligent exploration and exploitation of the potentialities inherent in experience." End of quote. Although empirical research methods have certainly been quite successful in the natural sciences, it is not unreasonable to ask whether the hypothetical deductive method alone is the most appropriate research tool for increasing our understanding of how human persons with immaterial souls and free will gain knowledge. Nevertheless, Dewey maintained that scientific method is the only authentic means at our command for getting at the significance of our everyday experiences of the world in which we live. Dewey was a democratic socialist. His philosophy, philosophy of education was influential not only in the United States, but also in Russia and the Soviet Union. In pre-revolutionary Russia, Dewey's ideas were adopted as part of an educational reform movement that only after the revolution became officially promoted by the Bolshevist government. Do Dewey visited Moscow and Leningrad in 1928 at the invitation of the Soviet Commissar for Education and met Nadezhda Krupskaya, widow of Vladimir Lenin, who had read and written about Dewey's work and who became Deputy Commissar for Education in 1929. Dewey praised, quote, the marvelous development of progressive educational ideas and practice under the fostering care of the Bolshevist government." End of quote. There are significant points of agreement between Dewey's philosophy of education and that of Anton Makarenko, who is sometimes called the John Dewey of the Soviet Union. In 1937, Dewey became chairman of the Commission of Inquiry into the charges made against Leon Trotsky in the Moscow trials, which concluded that Trotsky was not guilty. The strongest critique of progressivism and defense of classical education was led by Robert Maynard Hutchins, 1899 to 1977, and one of Dewey's former students, Mortimer Adler, 1902 to 2001. Hutchins wrote in 1936, quote, the most striking fact about the higher learning in America is the confusion that besets it. Our confusion 
is so great that we cannot make clear even to our own students what we are trying to do. End of quote. Hutchins identified the roots of an incorrect understanding of progress in the philosophies of Rene Descartes, David Hume, and Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who began to think as though nobody had ever thought before. Progress came to be understood as increase of information acquired by empirical research methods. As a consequence, the sciences one by one broke off from philosophy and then from one another. Finally, according to Hutchins, the whole structure of the university collapsed and the final victory of empiricism was won when the social sciences, law, and even philosophy and theology became themselves empirical and experimental and progressive. In 1942, Hutchins criticized an understanding of progress that is uninterested in intellectual debates of previous centuries. Quote, we attack old problems not knowing they are old and make the same mistakes because we do not know they were made. Dewey responded to Hutchins, criticizing his belief in perennial wisdom as inconsistent with scientific progress. Quote, the reactionary movement is dangerous, or would be if it made serious headway, because it ignores and in effect denies the principle of experimental inquiry and firsthand observation that is the lifeblood of the entire advance made in the sciences. An advance so marvelous that the progress in knowledge made in uncounted previous millennia is almost nothing in comparison." End of quote. Hutchins believed in the existence of a natural moral law that should guide all persons because all persons of the human race share a common human nature. Dewey rejected this belief as the expression of a provincial and conventional point of view, of a culture that is pre-scientific in the sense that science bears today. Adler acknowledged that classical education in the United States had deteriorated in the late 19th century, but argued that progressivism was an overreaction. Quote, progressive education in all its forms was a sound and genuine reaction against the extreme aridity and empty formalism of classical education, which had reached the limits of its own degradation at the end of the last century. Unhappily, as always, the reaction went too far. End of quote. In an article on teaching the English language, Adler criticized, quote, the situation in our progressive schools where writing and reading are done in complete isolation from any acquaintanceship with the rules of grammar and logic, end of quote. And in an article comparing and contrasting the education of children and adults, Adler wrote, quote, except for those progressive schools where teachers mistakenly try to become equal with their pupils by getting on the floor with them and by asking their opinions about everything, the classroom situation is one in which the teacher is superior." End of quote. In 1946, 
Adler and Hutchins created the Great Books of the Western World program at the University of Chicago. They wrote, quote, the best way to a liberal education in the West is through the greatest works the West has produced, end of quote. They stated explicitly that they offered this set of 54 volumes ranging from Homer to the 20th century in opposition to progressive education. Quote, we believe that in the passage of time, the neglect of these books in the 20th century will be regarded as an aberration and not, as it is sometimes called today, a sign of progress. We think that progress, and progress in education in particular, depends on the incorporation of the ideas and images included in this set in the daily lives of all of us, from childhood through old age." End of quote. Despite the arguments of Hutchins and Adler, progressive education gained the victory over classical education in the United States. Dewey's works are now mandatory reading for anyone seeking an academic degree in education. The tradition of natural law, moral virtues, and the common good is of merely historical interest, if of any interest at all. Pragmatism and positivism are dominant. Education is understood as learning facts that can be proven mathematically or empirically. Metaphysics, ethics, and religion are in the domain of values or opinions, which are not about what we think or know, but about how we feel. There is a shift in emphasis from learning to read and write well to learning how to achieve high scores on standardized tests, which yield mathematically precise data that can be analyzed by the techniques of statistics. When students do write, their work is to be graded by means of assessment rubrics, not prudential judgment, so that the data is free of bias. Alan Bloom of the University of Chicago's Great Books Tradition wrote near the end of the 20th century, quote, there is one thing a professor can be absolutely certain of. Almost every student entering the university believes, or says he believes, that truth is relative." End of quote. Today, we have moved beyond the relativism of truth and live in a post-truth world. To attribute all that is wrong in education today to Dewey and his disciples would be an unjust oversimplification. Nevertheless, Dewey's influence is a significant contributor. One reason progressive education has been successful in supplanting classical education is that it appears to be more appropriate for a democratic society. Dewey wrote, quote, one thing which has recommended the progressive movement is that it seems more in accord with the democratic ideal to which our people is committed than do the procedures of the, of the traditional school, end of quote. Classical education began in antiquity within aristocratic societies. Until relatively recently in Western history, formal education was for a privileged few 
not the general population. Plato's and Aristotle's arguments that democracy is worse than aristocracy are still relevant today. Thomas Aquinas believed that the best form of government is a mixed regime with elements of monarchy, aristocracy, and democracy. Contemporary scholars such as Richard Legutko of Poland and Patrick Deneen of the United States have called our attention to the vices of liberal democracy. Nevertheless, American society today is predominantly democratic with elements of oligarchy and plutocracy. And Dewey's progressivism is education for a democratic society. Dewey wrote, quote, a society to which stratification into separate classes would be fatal must see it that intellectual opportunities are accessible to all on equable and easy terms, end of quote. Despite their many agreement, disagreements, Adler agreed with Dewey that in a democracy, formal education should be open to everyone. Quote, we are politically a classless society. Our citizenry as a whole is our ruling class. We should therefore be an educationally classless society. End of quote. One consequence of making university education possible for many more people is a divide within universities between liberal and professional education, especially business education. As Dewey makes the point, quote, probably the most deep-seated antithesis which has shown itself in educational history is that between education in preparation for useful labor and education for a life of leisure, end of quote. While some university students are interested in knowledge for its own sake or knowledge for the sake of living a more excellent life, many, perhaps the majority, understand university education as an investment of time and money for the purpose of pursuing a more lucrative career. How can classical education exist in a collegial relationship with business education, especially if it is assumed as axiomatic that the social responsibility of business is to increase its profits. Dewey understood that this dichotomy between the liberal arts and the servile or practical arts has existed since the classical era. Quote, the separation of liberal education from professional and industrial education goes back to the time of the Greeks and was formulated expressly on the basis of a division of classes into those who had to labor for a living and those who were relieved from this necessity." End of quote. At this point in history, one that is quite different socially and economically from the centuries in which classical education took root, we need to integrate the liberal, uh, we need to integrate liberal and professional education and open classical education to all, including students of business administration. In thinking about how to provide classical education to all students, including those who are preparing for a career in commerce, we can learn from the works of French neo-Thomist philosopher 
Jacques Maritain, 1882 to 1973. Although their ideas on education tend to represent polar opposites, Dewey and Maritain were in agreement that we should eliminate the segregation of liberal and practical education. Maritain thought that the democratic way of life demands primarily liberal education for all. And he asked, quote, how is it possible to extend liberal education and training in the humanities not to a few more or less destined to a life of leisure, but to all, destined as they are to be involved in the toils and anxieties of daily labor, in the hard necessity of making a living, and who need for this vocational and technical training, end of quote. Maritain believed that the answer was to achieve an integral education for an integral humanism. He understood that if people are to avoid living divided lives, their education must be unified. Quote, the whole work of education and teaching must tend to unify not to spread out. It must strive to foster internal unity in man." End of quote. Education today suffers from two vices. First, it is dominated by a positivist, pragmatic, progressive philosophy of education that considers classical education to be antiquated and irrelevant. Knowledge is understood primarily as knowledge of facts that can be verified empirically or mathematically. Second, the classical education that still survives is separated from preparation for the careers that most citizens of contemporary democracies will pursue upon graduation. Progressive education has a competitive advantage relative to classical education because it is education for a democratic society, not for an aristocratic society that no longer exists. In order to promote classical education today, we need to integrate the liberal and practical arts. St. John Paul II's discussion of the subjective dimension of work teaches us that human persons can become virtuous not only through contemplation, but also through work. Although the classical tradition makes a distinction between theoretical and practical wisdom, both are virtues. Teaching students what it means to live a good life and teaching them how to earn a living should be understood as a unity, not as a duality. Maritain envisioned a world of tomorrow where the dignity of work will probably be more clearly recognized. And the social cleavage between homo faber and homo sapiens done away with. Classical education should be integrated with professional education, especially business education, so that students understand what it means to live a virtuous life in the world of work. Thank you very much.